Let's go back to the Word of God. And uh, the passage was nicely read to us by Sister Small uh, from uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings, the second chapter. And uh, so it was nicely read and handled by her. Our sermon for today, as you heard, is Elisha, Elijah's successor. Elisha, Elijah's successor. Our Father, grant us your wisdom as we listen to your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The term prophet is from a Greek word which means one who speaks on behalf of another. The modern concept of a prophet is one who predicts or forecasts the future. So foretelling, F-O-R-T-H, rather than foretelling, is a prophet's primary function. So every Sunday morning, once I'm preacher, or whoever preaching, and they're delivering God's word, we're doing the prophetic ministry. It's not only about predicting what will happen in 2024. It's not about just saying, well, predicting that perhaps the moon, there will be an eclipse pretty soon, perhaps tomorrow and it will happen. But when you speak about a prophet, a prophet is one who stands up and declare the word of Almighty God. The historian, if you notice, in chapters 2 Kings chapter 2, the historian leaves off the account of the kings to give attention to the close of Elijah's ministry and the beginning of Elisha's ministry as his successor. The prophet Elisha is introduced in 1 Kings chapter 19, 19 to 21. That's when we realize that the prophet Elisha is introduced. It was God who said, spoke to Elijah and told Elijah, Elijah, you have been complaining. You have said you are the only one preaching the word of God. And now I'm going to raise up another prophet by the name of Elisha. But I want, just want us to go to that passage because it's an important passage in 1 Kings chapter 19, 19. Continuing. This one is, So he departed thence, that's Elijah. And he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he with the twelve, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen, that's Elisha, and ran after Elijah, and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? And the Bible says, he returned back from him, and took a yoke of oxen, and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. And he gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose, and he went after Elijah, and he ministered unto him. It's interesting for us to note that when God wants a person, I want to tell you, he will make it known. God always has a replacement. Say it with me. God always, he has a replacement. It doesn't matter what area of ministry, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a missionary, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a wonderful police officer. It doesn't matter. The point is, no one has a permanent ministry here on earth. No one is indispensable. Someone will replace you someday. Elijah thought he 
alone was preaching the word. As a matter of fact, he had a successful ministry. That's Elijah. But Elijah had too much to do with Ahab and Jezebel. And if you have so much to do with Ahab and Jezebel, like Elijah had, then you will get discouraged. Jezebel was not an easy woman to deal with. And as a matter of fact, Elijah said, God, I'm tired. Tired dealing with this woman. As a matter of fact, Elijah at one point, he went and he hid himself. And on the juniper tree. And he said, God, I'm just worn. I'm just tired. You know, there comes a time in your life sometimes you say, I'm just tired. You hear a husband say, I'm tired. Don't get tired of your wife. <laughs> or you hear the wife says, I'm just frustrated. I'm just tired. Or perhaps you hear another person say, I'm, I don't know what to do. The point is that you and I, doesn't matter what, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, doesn't matter if you're a politician, here comes a time that you say, I'm just tired. But remember this, no one is indispensable. So, if you know this first point I want to make here, as we move from our introduction, and I know you're falling on the screen, so I want to make sure I don't leave you alone. Okay, this is what he says. God, let's say to the God's prophet of the northern kingdom. I'm taking time out to point out God's prophets of the northern kingdom. I spoke to you last Sunday concerning Solomon, the wisest man ever, the richest man ever, the most handsome man perhaps ever. He didn't live for a long time. Because he truly wasn't wise when you look at how he lived his life. But you see, a life outside of God will make you unwise. God made him wise. But he made foolish decisions. And so he died at a very early age. Before he reached the age of 60. After he came off the scene that Solomon. All the Bible says he slept with his father. And the kingdom was divided. So it was one Israel. Then the king one kingdom was divided Israel into the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Northern kingdom is submitted to you. The northern kingdom with Samaria being its capital, and then the southern kingdom with Jerusalem as its capital. Now the people of the northern kingdom, they were very unruly, were not easy to deal with. And that is why one of the prophets of that kingdom was Ahab and Jezebel. Now the, the Bible says that God raised up these prophets. So the first prophet that you're looking at is Elijah. Secondly, Elisha. Thirdly, Malachi. Fourthly, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. They were all prophets of the northern kingdom. God raised them up. Why did God raise up the prophets? As we said earlier, the prophet was one who stood and speak on behalf of another. And in its context, the prophets were those who they spoke on behalf of God. They were not afraid to speak for God because God communicated clearly to them. So we see the prophets of the northern kingdom. And next time you'll see the prophets of the southern kingdom. But we're looking at the northern kingdom. Let's move on. The second point is Elisha, a type of Christ. Elisha, a type of Christ. Why would I say Elisha was a type of Christ? Simply because when Jesus was on earth, Jesus cared about humanity. There's no other Old Testament prophet that cared so much. We see the humanity of that prophet dealing with human beings, helping human beings as the prophet Elisha. Other prophets, you might have looked at them and you might have said, but what about this prophet, that prophet? But there was no prophet like Elisha. So Elisha, we say, he was a type, types, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen about this prophet. We know he was the greatest miracle worker. 
in the Old Testament. That's Elisha, not Elijah. The greatest miracle worker of the Old Testament was Elisha. He was the son of Shaphat, as we know, a wealthy farmer who lived in the Jordan Valley. Let's look at the compassionate prophet who was like our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. What made him such a compassionate prophet? In 2 Kings chapter 2, 19 through 22, if you notice when the water was poisonous and they told Elisha, they said, Elisha, the men of this city said to Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord said, but the water is poisonous and the ground is fat barren. In other words, we're having a serious problem here in Israel. And he said, Bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of waters, and he cast his salt there and said, Thus said the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or buried lands. Look at verse 22. So the waters were healed unto the day of the writing of this book, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spoke. The water was healed. So in other words, he sweetens a spring of brackish water. When persons would have died, Elisha said, bring me the, the salt. And he placed it at the top of the spring. And brothers and sisters, the water was now wonderful to drink. So he helped humanity. If you watch his ministry, so he said the whole city is in problem. It's a beautiful city, but it's barren. No water, I can tell you. Don't we need the Elisha? Lord, send us what? Water. We prayed and God answered. We got some rain. But God is still alive today. Elisha's God is alive. And the church said, yeah. The second thing I want to point out, the miracle, or his compassionate spirit. That's Elisha. It's in 2 Kings chapter 4, 38 through 41. In that passage, Elisha came again to Gilgal, famous place. There was a dirt in that land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto the servant, Set on the grey pot and see pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herds. Be careful what you go and gather. And they found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild words, his lap full. And he came and he shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat. Verse 41. But he said, Bring, this one, then bring me, but he said, then bring me, and he cast it into the pot, and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat, and there was no harm in the pot. Isn't the God of Elisha still alive today? Yes, a dish of poisonous pottage. Elisha. People would have died. But Elisha, the man of God, was, in, uh, was there. Sounds like Jesus, when the disciples, they had their problems so often. And he helped people. You know, when Jesus was there, that's what he did. He helped people, right or wrong. And Elisha, you watch his ministry. He sweetened the spring of brackish water. He renders harmless a dish of poisonous pottage. Let's look at the fourth one. Third one, sorry. He multiplies a poor widow's cruise of oil. In 2 Kings 4, 1 through the 7. He multiplies a poor widow's cruise of oil. Now they cried a certain woman of the wise of the sons of the prophet unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him by two sons to be bond men. And Elisha said unto her, 
what shall I do for you? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said that Adelaide had not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few, just borrow plenty. And when thou art coming, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet another vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Last verse, verse 7. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Elisha helped this woman, this poor widow, lost her husband, didn't have anything. The creditors came in. They would have sold her and sold her property and sold everything. But Elisha came on the scene. And Elisha said, God has raised me up for a time such as this. The point I'm making, church. The church of Jesus Christ, we still have power because our God is still alive. She lacked nothing because she was able to pay up everything, pay up all her debt. Because the man of God told her, everything shall be well. It sounds like, oh master, fear not. Fear not. Everything will be well. Let's look to the other one. 2 Kings chapter 4, 32 through 36. 2 Kings chapter 4, 32 through 36. In all this story, he raises from the dead the son of the Shunammite woman. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead. He went in there, the child was dead, and laid upon his bed. He went in therefore and shut the door upon them twice and prayed unto the Lord. And he, and, he, and he went up, he lay upon the child, put his mouth upon his mouth, mouth to mouth, uh, this is uh, the citation, uh, and his eyes upon his head, eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child was what? Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. Miracles happened, eh? And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was coming unto him, he said, Take up thy son. In the New Testament, Jesus, he did so much wonderful things to people. So that hurting people were there. We live in a world where people are hurting. And we still need people like Elijah and people like Elisha. But I want to tell you, the God of Elisha is still in the land today. People need to turn to Almighty God. I think we have reached the place that people stop trusting God and we start trusting men, but we need to realize God is still depending upon us. It didn't stop there. Let's look at Elijah again, the man of God. In 2 Kings chapter 4, 42 to 44, he multiplies the loaves of bread for a hungry throne. Listen to what he says in verse 42. That's 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44. And there came a man from Baal Shalishma and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full of ears of corn in the box there. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, 
What should I say this before an hundred men? That's nothing. He said again, give the people that they may eat. For thus said the Lord, they shall eat and shall be thereof. So he said it before them. And they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. Jesus did it in the New Testament. He fed the hungry. He used that little boy with five loaves. Remember? The point I'm saying, Elisha, he did it way back there. You know, God can feed you. Some people were all wondering, oh, I wonder how we're going to make it. So many things happening in this world. Some people say, we're going to starve to death. I tell the God that I serve, I'm going to eat until I get fasting. I have to exercise to keep the weight down. I'm not wanting more food to come from. And I say to every member of this church, go around wondering. Listen, our hope is not in governments. Our hope is in God Almighty. He will feed us. You can hear that? Our hope is in God. Elisha's hope was in God. And Elisha knew that when he called upon God, God would have come through. So that is why he said, listen, our God can do it. And our God can certainly do it. Let's move on to the other. You see all the, the miracle working. And that's why he was a compassionate prophet. That's Elisha. He not only was a miracle worker, but you watch his compassion. The next thing though, and you know this one very well, he is a Syrian official of leprosy. We all know his name. And we read that in 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 to 16. But we are not going to read all the passage, but 2 Kings 5, 1 to the 16. Naaman was a great official. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, honorable, because by him, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of God, but he was what? A leper. Great man, that's all you're going to read. Great man, he was a leper. Honorable man, but he was a leper. Every person we know God today, we are lepers. We have leprosy, sin makes us lepers. And that is why Naaman, physically he was not well. Great man, honorable man, the king admired him, great man for the master, but he had a problem. And when you have leprosy, it's like the virus. Stay six feet. Stay away. Elisha, When he heard the like a synopsis though, Elisha, when he heard that there was a problem because Naaman was sent down to Israel because he needed help. And the king said, Oh, can I help this man? Elisha heard he was sent, and Elisha, all Elisha said to his servant, Go and tell that man, Naaman, just go down to that river. And dip seven times, and you shall be what? Healed. But you know, some people do not make big things. And the man thought, well, I thought he was going to come to me and perhaps put his staff on me and say, You're healed. But the prophet said, I don't have to come. You know, sometimes our pride can keep us from receiving the blessing. Nay, man, he was sick, but he had too much pride. Some people want help, they never ask. And sometimes you're right. Because you don't really need the help. But if you need help, ask. It's either yes or what? No matter of fact, he was sent down there. But because he thought to himself, I thought you have sent me to one of those great rivers. Send me up to the, you know, the other rivers in Antigua, down to Dominica, one of the best rivers down there, or perhaps down to one of the islands or in Guyana. But the point is, I thought you would have sent me there. But Naaman, he received his healing when he obeyed. He went and he dipped seven times, 
And he was what? Miraculous or what? Yeah. Elisha said, do that. And it will happen. Let's look at the last one. What about the last one? Show compassion. I'm going to... Elisha's generous treatment of the Syrian troops who were sent to capture him. And you're going to see that in 2 Kings chapter 6. Go over to 2 Kings chapter 6. Verses 8. I'm going to begin at verse 8. The king of Syria warred against Israel to come with his servant, saying, In such and such a place, they shall be my camp. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, that's Elisha, sent to Israel's king, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place for thither, for the Syrians are come down. Let's go. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him, and warned him off, and saved himself there several times. Let's go. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for afraid. For this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Are you for me or are you against me? And one of his servants said, Not my Lord, nobody against you, we all love you. Okay, but Elisha, and here's the problem, Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, tell it the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in your bedroom. And he said, go and spy. The king said, go and look for him. That I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he for the horses. Listen what happened. For one man, horses, chariots, and great horse. And they came by night, and they surrounded the city. Verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone for the whole and host come past this city, both with horses and chariots. But hear this, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, the servant of Elisha, what are we going to do? And he answered, hear the words of our Lord, fear not. Let's say it again. Yeah. Say it again. Yeah. Often Jesus said that what? Fear not. Hear what Elisha said to the servant. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You can send the chariots, you can send the horses, but when you are on the Lord's side and when God is on your side, no weapon form shall ever prosper. Elisha said to the servant, take it easy, fear not. And I say to every Christian, every member of this church, everyone who attends here, sometimes we reach the point, especially in this pandemic, that too many of us, we falter and we are ready to give up. I say like Jesus, fear not. I say like Elisha, the prophet of God, what? Fear not. Fear not. We will stop there. Let's move on. Elisha prayed. Thank God for people who can pray. Elisha what? Prayed. And said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So listen, Christians, I'm going to go on just a minute. As Christians, sometimes we can't see too far. You must have the eyes of God if you're going to see things. In the natural, you cannot see some things. That is why the child of God, we must be spiritually anointed. We need the Spirit of God if we're going to see something. That is what happened many times. We are blind and we need God's Spirit to open our eyes so we can see and we can understand what is happening around us. They that are against us, listen, they are in the minority. But the God of hosts is for us. 
You're going to anoint two king, and then Elisha is going to be your successor. Let's move on. Elisha does last word. In now, I might say, speak away. Second Kings chapter 2. We're back to Second Kings again, chapter 2. In Second Kings chapter 2, pray to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven, my worldly. Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And I want to know this. He went from Gilgal. God's Spirit, hear this, reveal to Elijah. Elisha, right in that passage, keep it this, this is right. God's Spirit revealed to Elijah. He revealed to Elisha and he revealed to the younger prophets that Elijah, departure from earth, was very near. Chapter 2, verses 1, 3, 5. God's Spirit revealed to his servant. He said, Elijah, listen, you have completed your task. Secondly, he said, Elisha, you are going to take over. And then if you notice, the younger prophets also knew God revealed to them. The sons of the prophet, that's a younger prophet, those students were, were studying on Elijah. God, so God revealed to Elijah, listen carefully, God revealed to Elisha, and God revealed to the sons of the prophets, or the younger prophet, that Elijah, the great prophet, would have been taken. It was not a secret. God says, I'm going to take Elijah, this time on earth is completed. We read of two men in scripture who were translated. Enoch and Brother Elijah. Elijah's ministry was completed. So this is what happened now. Elisha went with Elijah from Gilgal to Bethel. Then from Bethel to Jericho. And then across the Jordan River. Watch the directive. Gilgal, Bethel. It's in chapter 2. Read it. Gilgal, Bethel. Jericho, and then across the Jordan. Everywhere Elijah went. Listen carefully. Elisha said, I'm not going to leave you. He said, I need the blessing of God. Elijah, you're going to go. But I need, if I'm going to take that office, I need you to pronounce some blessing on me. So even when you go to St. John's, I'm going to be there. If you take a plane and go to St. Kitts, I'm still going to be there. If you want to go to London, I'm going to be right there with you. Doesn't matter where you go. I don't want you to go and I don't receive my blessing. So hear this. The young prophets, they stood beyond Jordan. And they did not have the privilege of witnessing the personal departure of Elijah. Only Elisha started. In verse 7 of chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went, stood to view afar off, no afar off, and they stood by the Jordan. Important place. They stood to view afar off. But listen, look at um, 9 to 10, Elisha's final request. Listen, verse 9. If we could go to verse 9, we see his final request. He requested of Elisha, and came to pass when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Ask, it reminds us of Solomon. When God said to Solomon, Solomon, ask what I can, what I can do for you. Anything you ask. He asked for a wise heart, wisdom to lead his people. This man, he asks that God would bless him in such a way 
towards, and, and he said, I need this is what he said. Let's go back to verse 9 again. In verse 9, came to pass when they were gone over the Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from you. Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now, based on Deuteronomy, when you go, we can look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 21, 15 through 17. Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17. Based on that, we have the same expression, double portion, is applied to that which the firstborn received of the Father's inheritance. That's what Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17. The firstborn would have received the double portion of the father's inheritance. Elisha viewed himself as Elijah's firstborn prophet or prophet son. So he wanted Elijah to really give him this blessing. The mantle suggests that really he says, when I go, if I see, if you see me, when I depart, Elisha, then the mantle would have been thrown. And you go and take up that mantle. That suggests that the office of Elijah was now passed on to Elisha. Once you get that mantle. But you see, Elisha needed more than the mantle, needed more than an office. Elisha needed the spirit and the blessing of God to come upon him. You can get in an office, but you need the anointing of God to stay in that office. And that is what Elisha needed. So when Elisha said, I pray thee, my father, that a double portion of your spirit will come upon me. Elisha was saying in essence, God, I need more than just be in that office. I need the spirit of God. I say again to a church that what we need today, we need the mantle, but we need more than the mantle. We need the spirit of God to take possession of men and women in his church and things will be different. Praise his holy name. The mantle suggests the office. Anybody can get in an office. But when you get in that office, you need the anointing. And only the Spirit of God can breathe on you. And the church say, we need the Spirit of God. And if ever a time you need Him, it is now. But look at Elisha's question. We're moving on. Five minutes time, I'll be closing. Elisha's question. Chapter 2, 13 through to 15, that's where we are. In, in, in that passage, 13, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. So he got the mantle. And he went back. And he stood by the bank of the Jordan. Very precious river. The bank of the Jordan. Elijah crossed the Jordan going for his farewell or his translation. Elisha coming back, he has to cross the Jordan as well. Humanly speaking, he couldn't do it. So he needed the mantle. This is what he took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. He smote the water and said, We is the Lord God of Elijah. And when he also had seen it to the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha, he went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to do the Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah, God rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They also recognized that God was doing something in Elisha's life. People will know when you are serious with God. You know, in the church, I grew up in the church a long time. I see all sorts of games. I see all sorts of sports in church. Well, if it's one place people can play games, and those who are viewing me across, one place people can play games in church. And a nice and Sapphira tried something. But God killed them off. And people do all sorts of things in church. 
I say what we need, listen man, you can frighten God. And you can impact God and you can impress God. But one thing you can do, you can walk close to your God. And God knows. And when the sons of the prophet, 50 prophets, students they were, when they saw Elisha return, remember he already was in the mantle to hit the water and water was divided. He was able to go across. He went with Elijah over the Jordan, but he came back by himself. He cannot depend on Elijah. Some of us, if you're going to depend on people to make it in the kingdom of God, you will fail. But God promised he will never leave us. Neither will he what? You don't have to be like other people. Be yourself. Love God. Serve God. Get excited about God. When others, listen man, they're playing games. You tell yourself, I'm not in any game business. I love him too much to fail in love. Elijah of God. He said, Elijah, I need that double portion. Elijah said, I can't give you. But when I'm taken, if you see me and take up my mantle, yes, the office will be available. And the anointing can be available. So he received a double. He received the mantle. But he also received the Spirit's possession. So that Elijah from that moment, he was so filled with the Spirit. So when the prophet saw him, Everyone they recognize this is our future leader. It's anointed by God, touched by God. Things happen. It was Dr. J. R. B. Chapman, a great Bible scholar, one of our great Bible scholars. He said Elisha had the mantle, the symbol of the prophetic office. But he also asked for more. He wanted the presence of the Lord himself. So that phrase that Elisha asks, where is the God of Elijah? I close by saying the God of Elijah, he is a God who will provide. Amen. So don't worry, God will provide. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor that. Say it again. Secondly, where is the God of Elijah? He is a God who answers by fire. Yes, he will come through. When Elijah asked God, God, when the other prophets could get it done, false prophets, Elijah prayed that fire would come down. God answered by fire. Yes, where is the God of Elijah? He is a God who hears us when we pray. When we pray, he still has to pray. Fourthly, where is the God of Elijah? He's still God. At your loneliest moment, that juniper tree experience for Elijah was a terrible one. He said to God, God, he says, I felt as if I'm alone. That's in 1 Kings 19, 14 through 15. He said, God, I felt as if I'm alone. I'm the only one, only one. You know, sometimes we feel as Christians, we are the only ones who stand standing up for God. God said to Elijah, I have 7,000 prophets who have not bowed their knees unto me. And lastly, the question, the phrase, where is the God of Elijah? He is a God who imparts his spirit to his servants. And we find that in 2 Kings, uh, chapter 2, 9 through 12. That's what God did. He imparted his spirit unto Elisha. Elisha stands out as one of the important types of Christ in the Old Testament. His knowledge of men, his skill in speaking the right words at the right time, great teacher of young prophets and the training of his followers. He did many mighty work for God, merciful work. And God was able to use Elisha to do wonders in that northern kingdom. I close by saying to them, the God that we serve today is still with us. Where is the God of Elijah? He's the same God who has protected us for nearly two years in this pandemic. 
That's the God of Elijah. Where is the God of Elijah? When it's supermarkets, you have to long lines. Thank God we can still get food in the supermarkets. The God of Elijah is still with us. You might wonder, what about Christmas is coming? And I want to say, those who wonder where Christmas is coming, it's not about Turkey and Ham either. It's about the Christ child. It's about singing glory to Him. It's about praising Him. But you and I, we celebrate well because our Savior is born. And I want to tell you, the same God who sent His Son in this world to die for us, is with us today. And Christmas will be great because we place our faith and our trust in that way. Give God a big hand, my friend. Give God a praise. Give God a praise. Let's all stand together.